recorded. So perfect timing. So if you are uncomfortable with being recorded, uh, turn your camera off and we'll, we can also have the chat function. So you can send any uh, questions that you don't want to say out loud to directly to myself or directly to TAF, or um, you can also just send it in the chat if you're comfortable with that. Uh, so this is not a debate session. Um, it's a discussion among members. So our main goals are to get ideas from you and to work with your ideas. And we really, really value your opinions and perspectives. So please deliver them in a respectful manner because we are here today with people who just want the best for all of us. And I guess I skipped over um, an introduction of myself, but my name is Hannah Tate and my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the student union president. And I'd also like to introduce Tayef, who has, is the research analyst within URSU and has been doing lots of different work within this. And so Tayef will also be presenting certain aspects of today with me. And so uh, welcome everyone. And now on our screen, you can see our agenda for today. So we're going to try really hard to stick um, to the time frame. And it looks like I'm a minute early right now, which is exciting. But um, we're going to stick to the schedule, but also keep it flexible because this is about discussion and feedback. So if something um, needs to be spoken about a little bit more, we can definitely do that, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time because I definitely know how student, how busy students are. And so with that, um, we can go into the URSU governance review. Tayef's going to be walking us through our current governance model. Oh, thank you, Hannah. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, so as Hannah said, my name is Tf Ahmed. I work as a research and policy analyst. Um, my job is very broad, but at the same time, in these last few months, I have only worked with the governance uh, of the Wurzu and how it would look like in the next um, few years. Um, so I'm just going to go through. Um, so before we make uh, propose some changes or something, we talk about our changes. I'm going to go to how we are right now and then uh, how we are being governed in the board of directors and executive committee. So um, what's the governance structure um, as of today is um, our main, um, uh, all of the decision, our main decision holder, ultimate decision making body is the membership and membership um, elect um, once in a year with the elections and by election instead of board of directors. Um, board of directors come from constituents um, come from faculty representative and a federal colleges. So we have 22 um, um, board of directors who come from different faculties, constituents, and, and then um, a federal colleges. But we also have four executives right now as so a president, uh, BP, um, uh, student affairs, BP, external affairs, BP, operation and finance. And we also at yearly basis in AGM or SGM, we um, uh, appoint an auditor to audit our financial um, uh, financial capacity of the union. Within our governance structure, we also have a general manager who is responsible for um, maintaining board operation as well as the management of the Ursu. They're the chief of the staff. They maintain the staff and operation of the business. Um, and then under the general manager, we have many, many full-time and part-time and temporary um, staff who um, actually carry out with all the duties and, and then work of the students union, um, such as services and uh, lots and lots of programs with the direction of the board and executive committee. So before we move into the next slide, I just wanted to um, emphasize. Um, so you see um, a lot of non-profit organization, uh, a board of directors is the main governing body, but with our students union new uh, current governing structure, that is not the case. Uh, we have a two governing body. Uh, one is board of directors, another one is executives. So executive itself is a um, itself is an individual governing body. They directly report to the board, but at the same time, in a non-profit structure, is is kind of weird. Um, in a, in a ways that um, uh, sometimes um, board of directors cannot directly um, interfere with the executive decision, and then they they find themselves in a position where they are probably having a conflict, um, board versus executive, most of the time. So in other, uh, with, it, within our um, Nonprofit Corporation Act, what is provided in Saskatchewan and other nonprofit organization, 
a board of directors can appoint within themselves or a members officers of the union and then officers who work for the board and they get direction for the board and board can directly manage them. Uh, but in our case, uh, in our governance um, documents or anywhere, we haven't mentioned whether the executives are the officers of the board or whether they're not the officers. We mentioned their individual governing body. Um, I'll move it to your next slide. So um, we have determined um, some strengths of our current governance model, as well as some weaknesses. We'll go to the strengths right now. So uh, first strength is our finance. We're financially very stable organization. We have a um, uh, we have a large group of me membership, and then um, they uh, um, give us uh, money every every semester. So we charge a membership fee to all of the um, students uh, who are studying for credit, non credit, um, and then audit. And then second strength of our uh, governance model is we have a very diverse group of people. Um, so we have people from a lot of ethnic backgrounds, a lot of faculties, constituents, and they make a very good uh, board of directors. And they have a different, different um, perspective on different, different issues. So the board can um, get some, a lot of help in, in this capacity. And um, third strength is we have lots of executive projects. So executive project, since we have, we elect executives every single year, executives come with a lot of enthusiasm and vision and they create a lot of projects. Although some of the projects do not sustain um, in a long term, but they do uh, introduce a lot of the projects, they do carry out some of the work for the members. And the fourth important um, strength of the current governance model is um, we have a system of recruiting member at large in our committees. And over the last few years, we have seen a member at large in the committees, they're contributing um, significantly than if, I compared, if we compare it to the board members in themselves. Um, and then we have a lots of ongoing projects within our current governance model. Um, so because of that, we have a large board and then diverse group of people. It is likely, it is more likely the board approves all of the projects that are being proposed by the executives and, the, and then, and then the, by the other board of directors. Now we'll move into um, the weaknesses of current governance model. So there are lots of weaknesses in our current governance model, but I'll just go um, and then talk about some of the highlights of the weaknesses. So um, we have a very poor board governance that includes um, uh, the management of the board activity on a um, day-to-day -day basis, um, keeping the records of the board activities. That includes also participation of the board of directors in the board activities. Um, second is rubber stamp board. So um, in, in most capacity, our board has become in a way, so it is more likely to accept things rather than uh, having a discussion and accept things. Um, so over the past uh, few years, in, a, in a, uh, researching the board of documents, we have seen um, board um, find themselves in a position where uh, participation in a discussion or decision making is not that is not significantly high. Um, so if anyone going, for example, an executive is going with a proposal, they will more likely to accept uh, rather than thinking about the mission and vision of the organization and strategic planning. That being said, um, uh, the third um, figure, the third weakness is, is, is going to be board um, and committee engagement in decision making process. So we have, um, we do not, I'm going to uh, go to the un unorganized structure, but um, we do not have a very formalized structure of our committees um, in our governance uh, document and governance model. model. That's why uh, we, in every committee is very different. Every committee is governed in a very different composition of the committee varies uh, from um, day to day, time to time. Um, for that reason, um, our committee engagement is not as uh, effective. At some point, most of the, in, in most, most time, we find uh, our committee is very dysfunctional and they do not um, carry out uh, some of the values that board wants them to carry out. And fourth, if you witnessed the Ursu before, is the most important uh, weaknesses that we have found um, is internal conflict. So every year we find ourselves in a, ourselves in a position where we're conflicting internally. Uh, that could be uh, staff between the executives, executive between the board, and that result a lot of uh, reputational um, uh, damage of the union over the past few years. Um, fifth, we have a lack of governance education and board training. Um, we haven't had any any kind of formal structure of how board will be um, trained, and then how uh, 
we're gonna continue having the ongoing uh, governance education within the board. So most of the board uh, members find themselves in a position where they do not know how the organization is run and what the governance document tells itself. And third is unorganized structure in the board level. So we do not have a formalized structure of our co uh, committees as well as we do not have a formalized structure of how um, the board will work and then what they will discuss in the board meetings. Um, so um, right now, anything can be discussed in the board meeting, but that is not very productive in terms of the governance, um, good governance um, principle. And, uh, and then the second one is vacancy in the board. If you have noticed, um, that you would see that um, every year we struggle with the vacancy in the board. There are at least like five and six um, vacancy every year remain. And then there are also some, um, at some point of the year, people start resigning from the board. And that uh, leads to a question whether the board um, is capable of making some sort of decision within the small capacity, um, just because we're not missing out a lot of things. And just because we ha don't have any um, um, appointing process for the board in the vacancy, we have to wait another uh, six months for by-election. And even in the by-election, we do not find um, um, candidates to fill the vacancy. So every year um, we are left out with three, four, five vacancies in the board. And then one of the most important um, aspect is we, um, um, our governing documents um, were produced um, 28 years ago, and we haven't reviewed them uh, for a very, very long time. And every year there were some changes. Because of these changes, we actually lost our, uh, our value of the documents and a lot of things are unexplained and a lot of things do not align with the legal um, requirement. And that puts that in a very legal jeopardy of the organization. And then last but not the least, executive and the board conflict. So as I mentioned in my first slide, um, we have a diff two different governing body. Just because two different governing body, we uh, find them in a way the executives are having conflict with the board of directors often time. Uh, and that results a lot of uh, mismanagement in terms of the board governance. Okay, so Final keynote within, within our research consultation, we have found the weaknesses outweigh our strengths significantly. It's, it's not 50-50, not 50-60, but it's something very significant. And uh, we have determined or we have um, noticed in our governance structure. And that will result our new proposed changes. So last, um, how have, you deter have we determined um, these strengths and weaknesses? You might have a question, how do we know uh, this kind of uh, problem? So first, we have done a um, thorough consultation with our members. Um, um, up until now, I have talked to 27 people um, who have requested and, I, and who have I had a chat with over the last uh, one and a half month. And uh, we have also talked to the, the membership and then we have proposed some of the ideas to them and they have given us the feedback, not only this time, but in a previous time in a different, different manners. And um, third, we have um, researched our governing documents, not only our governing documents, but also governing documents of other nonprofit organization and other students unions, and as well as our act, um, which we are regulated with. With that, um, I will um, take questions if you have um, so far, and then after the question, uh, I'll try to answer, Hannah will answer, and we have our gover governance committee here, and they will try to answer, and then we'll move into the next item. Thank you. Was there any questions on what TIF has gone over? I'll give it a couple more seconds here. So definitely use the chat or raise your hand or you can direct message TIF or I. Amanda. Hi, everybody. My name is Amanda Leader. Um, 
I'm a student at uh, U of R and FNU. Um, I must, if I miss this, I apologize. But um, so are you guys going to be changing that structure so that you guys will be able to um, fill those positions uh, before the next election? Great question. So yes, we just did a quick review of kind of how things are now. And then we did a quick discussion on how we kind of came to the conclusion. So we did some um, explanation of how we are now. And then we did some explanation of our strengths and weaknesses. And then uh, just following this little question period, we'll be talking about some of the changes where we have um, found that are wanted by membership. Awesome, thank you. Okay, and I have a question about uh, board member performance. And so we can definitely, we will be addressing the board member performance um, going forward. And um, Emily sent a question in the chat. How were the consultations done? Was it only students who asked for a consult or did you reach out to groups? Great question. So um, TAF can definitely fill in a couple details, but um, we actually spoke to multiple student members. We also spoke to uh, past board members and executives as well. And a lot of those board members and executives have gone on to do different uh, things in nonprofit and governance. So we we're really excited to have some of their feedback to understand some of their experiences and their suggestions to how to go forward. But the consultations and the information that we've gathered is like very membership focused. And we have also been um, sending out multiple emails. So we have sent emails out to all of our membership for inviting feedback. And then um, we've also been inviting uh, different stakeholder groups. So we have invited um, student societies to provide feedback and we've also made um, special, um, sorry, we've also connected with different student groups. Um, so Amanda had been speaking previously and so we have been made making sure to connect to First Nations University as well, because um, our membership there really needs representation in our board. And so to figure out how that worked, we also consulted with them. And so lots of different consultations and that process. Does that clear up your question, Emily? Sure does. Yeah, no, I was just wondering if you guys had like a PAC consultation with just like the presidents or if it was kind of widespread outreach to a lot of the student groups to kind of chat about it, because I know that it like impacts the clubs, obviously, um, as members, but also as like kind of participating in Ursu's operations, too. So, yeah, that definitely answers it. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. And I think that um Obviously, members that aren't involved in a club definitely have a voice in this process, but different clubs and societies have like elected people that are representing their constituencies like um, interests. So consulting with them has been really important as well. And I love that question. Anything else? Um, I just wanted to mention, um, our consultation hasn't ended yet. Um, so uh, we still have time and at this time we prepared because some of the things when you haven't had any preparation of anything, if you ask people or clubs, they have nothing, they have like blank page to think about. So when you prepare the first draft, which is what we're doing right now, so we can give them some of the option and they can give the feedback. So next 10 days, we will do thorough consultation um, with the groups, clubs, societies, as well as the uh, membership at large. So you will you will get an email from me, Emily. <laughs> Just to highlight something that TF mentioned, what we're presenting today is not final. We're doing this because we need to have a discussion to make sure that this draft is kind of on the right direction and the right path. So this is feedback. This isn't us um, like looking for approval on this. Um, it's just to really make sure that we have understood the needs of members and how to move forward to make sure we can understand more. Okay.
Okay. So throughout this process, our big objectives was ensuring that we strengthen student leadership. So having students lead the organization is very important as like the lived experience as a student and the on the ground experience is going to be really important to determining the direction of the student union. We have also been um, really focusing on conflict management because having this sort of um, experience where there is a lot of conflict isn't healthy for individuals who are working within the organization. It's not healthy for membership engagement and it's not healthy for the organization overall. We also really want to focus on good governance. So this means that there's going to be accountability and understanding about roles and responsibilities. And so good governance is another big objective. And um, equity, diversity and inclusion. And so um, historically, governance hasn't always focused on EDI principles, but ensuring that we meet the needs of our very diverse membership is very important. And then also making sure that Earth 2 governance is a place for every single member. All 16,000 um, diverse individuals need to see themselves um, within the organization and also be able to understand that Ursu is um, foundationally based on EDI principles. So those were some of our objectives. And so um, looking at the governance structure. So of course, our membership is the ultimate uh, decision making authority and TAF has explained those responsibilities. And so this membership engagement happens through our AGMs and elections and uh, SGMs. And then we have our auditor who is appointed and that is also a legal requirement and then a board of directors so that doesn't change either the board of directors is like the more mid to short term kind of decision makers um, so we act on behalf of membership as the board of directors and then um, we have our general manager who is appointed and so they are directly answerable to the board of directors uh, and the executive director so this is a new um, position that we have come to a general kind of understanding that this is necessary for the health of the organization, and they would also be directly accountable to the board of directors. And then we have standing committees. And so standing committees are slightly um, outlined in different legal responsibilities of nonprofit organizations, and then they provide kind of special expertise and knowledge to the board of directors, and we're going to be getting into more details there, and they are appointed by the board, and then our officers. So uh, traditionally, these were only elected but we are proposing a bit of a change and we're gonna have officers that are elected and appointed. And you might be more familiar with the term um, executive. So this would be our vice presidents and the president. So those would be roles you're most familiar with. And um, then we'll get more into the details about what we mean by appointed. And so that is another change to highlight. And then, as per usual, our staff are hired and they are managed directly by the general manager. And then eventually that accountability does float up to the board of directors. So that way um, we can make sure there's accountability and security. So that was just a quick overview and we have lots of details to follow, but I would like to pay special attention to some of the bigger changes, such as the executive director, as well as the officers that will be elected and appointed. Was there any preliminary questions? And some of these might be answered later on, but I would love to hear them as we go. Okay. We'll move into the next slide. So um, we are proposing a couple changes. So this is really exciting because I do think that um, this reflects lots of the consultation feedback. And again, this is not set in stone. So voice your opinion if you're seeing something you're not liking. So based on our objectives that I previously outlined, a new board training program is going to be really important to make sure that our board is empowered 
for accountability and ensuring that they have a good experience as individual board members, but they can also fulfill their different responsibilities. And then we have a restated Articles of Incorporation. So this was one of the big um, issues that had spurred a change. So to uh, really uh, fit in with the Nonprofit Corporations Act, these Articles of Incorporation were required. And uh, we're gonna be also having new bylaws. And so those will be explained a little bit more further on. And we also will be having new board policies, but um, the bylaws and the new board policies kind of trickle down from the restated articles of incorporation in compliance with the Nonprofits Act. And one big change that has been really exciting is we are proposing uh, introducing a vice president of reconciliation. So this is going to formalize um, indigenous representation within a full-time executive position if it is passed. And so having this position is going to make sure that the student union is able to advocate and understand and um, ensure that there's a place for all members as well as continuing to work towards um, aspects of decolonization. And uh, the other change was the executive director. So this executive director is dedicated um, directly to the board to maintain board operations. And so board operations include like agendas and meeting minutes and scheduling, as well as um, the different board training aspects. So having that support directly for our board is gonna help us um, uh, ensure that we have our board being comfortable and able to fill the responsibilities. And I see a question. Um, in terms of implementation, this, we can't plan quite on implementation because this still needs to be passed by our membership. So we'll be having a special general meeting and then potentially this would be implemented, um, well, if it's passed by spring, um, slowly introducing it. And we are hoping to, if it's passed, we would be running our election that happens in the winter academic semester. Um, it will be, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but we are hoping to run the next elections based on this uh, proposed changes. And the VP of Reconciliation would be an elected student position. And so we are discussing the different aspects of ensuring that um, the appropriate people are running for this position but we can have more details on that after. But yes, that would be a student elected position and they would be working full-time. Okay, and then another really exciting change, five new associate vice presidents. So this is uh, one of our bigger changes. So that's gonna be five new part-time roles and um, they would be directly answerable to the board. And, um, uh, so the next aspect, and we're going to talk more about the AVPs in more detail, uh, such as like the titles and stuff like that going forward in the next couple slides. And we're going to be able to separate board and operations. So that reduces the workload of the general manager, because the function of the board is to oversee operations. It's about checks and balances. So separating the board and operations is going to be able to help us get really good governance and accountability for everyone in the whole organization. And reducing the workload is also really important to make sure that everybody can meet their commitments. And then we see um, a smaller board, which is going to help improve um, collaboration and teamwork. And so the board members um, need to be fully invested and fully involved. And then sometimes with a larger board, it, as TAF had mentioned, it becomes rubber stamp or not fully um, being able to fulfill fiduciary duty. And there's also lots of benefits to having a board that's like closely um, united and comfortable with each other and that team bonding kind of aspect. And then we are suggesting an 
appointment system for vacant positions. And so that's going to ensure that even if somebody isn't running in an election, the board is not going to be at a loss for having those. Another change, uh, looking at our elections. So our board terms, as well as our executive terms, are one year long. So Right now we have a general election and then we have a by-election, but with the appointment process for vacant positions, we won't need to be filling positions at the by-election. Another um, difficulty with by-elections is then that the new board members or new executives have such a short period of time to understand their roles and responsibilities. And so um, removing that by-election is gonna remove some of the, back and forth and confusion and like redoing say like certain training aspects and so it's going to keep the board a little bit more stable and um, some of the changes are going to provide more representation of marginalized students on satellite campuses so i see lots of questions in the chat okay can an alumni be in that role with experience? That's a very good question, but I believe um, we need elected representatives that are from our membership. And so to be a member, you do need to be, um, or to be a member with full rights, you need to be a current student. So that is something that's kind of stipulated in the Nonprofit Act, but um, so alumni, I don't believe would be um, acceptable in terms of legal responsibilities for that position. And we've seen struggles with URSU and the staff slash manager positions maintaining operations. How will it be different with the executive director? And how will you still ensure student leadership is prevalent with an employee leading the board? And totally agree, more structure, needed in this. So yay. I agree. Yay. Um, so um, we're not replacing the general manager. Um, the general manager would just be on the operation side and then an executive director would be working directly with the board. And the role of an executive director is to facilitate and empower the board. So they're not going to be, um, I don't know, I wouldn't consider it the executive director leading the board, I would consider it them facilitating the board. And so um, with the executive director having that one focus of the board, I think that um, we've going, we're going to be able to um, ensure accountability to the operation side. And so um, maintaining operations will be able to still continue as well as the executive director is going to empower the board to fully understand the roles and responsibilities because sometimes it can get confusing as a board member when they are um, just understanding their roles and responsibilities. And I think some of that has historically created conflict, whether the um, board gets a little bit operational. So that I think will be resolved. And so that's actually going to remove a bit of conflict. And yes, and then I answered about the employee leading the board. The employee will be facilitating the board, but it's still student focused and run. And uh, Keegan, I see your question. And it's really important that we still have a chair position because that chair position is another um, specific skill set, but it also is going to ensure that good governance is followed. And appointment process, really good question. And we're going to be addressing that um, uh, just in the next couple slides, because it is a bit of a process, but we have a committee and we're really excited to be introducing that. And um, Ooh, I'm not sure how we're going for time on the agenda, but I'm loving these questions. But I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay, so looking at our board composition. So we're considering five executive officers. So that would be the president and four vice presidents. And we're looking at 12 faculty representatives 
and three federated colleges representatives. And then the executive director is involved in the board, but they are non-voting because they are not a student union member. And so the officers of the board, so, oh, Okay, can we go back one slide and I'm just going to outline the executive officers really quickly. Oh, you have it there. Um, so we have our president and then we have our vice presidents and the president still does not have any sort of like dominating powers over the vice presidents. It's still an equal um, structure how it is now. Um, for example, myself and our VPs each get one vote. And if I disagree, I can't like override their votes. So that's really important to recognize. And then our VP positions. So a vice president of advocacy and campaigns. And I don't want to make a direct comparison, but this would be slightly similar to the current VP external, but more targeted and focused towards advocacy and campaigns. And then the previously mentioned uh, VP reconciliation, uh, focusing on reconciliation and representation um, within URSU, but also outside of URSU. And then our VP student affairs, and then VP internal affairs. So this, the VP internal affairs is kind of a title change and there'll be some responsibility changes, but that's relatively equal to a VP operations and finance. And our really exciting uh, associate vice presidents. So looking at the associate vice presidents would not be working full time. And as we mentioned, these are appointed. So, uh, AVP of diversity and inclusion. So building this in um, to the officers of the board is going to be um, replacing some of the equity considerations and um, that our board used to address, but this is going to be bringing in equity considerations right into the officer roles. And then our AVP uh, communications and outreach. Engaging with members is of the utmost importance and making sure that our members can be um, communicated to is going to be a really big priority um, because like the current structure is a little bit tricky because um, just speaking from my personal experience, um, president, I'm meeting with um, external elected officials, I'm meeting with the university administration, I'm meeting with clubs, I'm meeting with societies. And I also need to make sure that I am listening to and understanding 16,000 people, all of our members. So having um, a targeted AVP for communications and outreach is going to make that a bit easier for our members and our stakeholders, as well as whatever whoever the executives are next year. And then our AVP equity and sustainability. URSU has made it a priority um, on behalf of our membership and guided by our membership to really push the sustainability initiatives and because it's like our future. Um, so making sure that we have a student voice involved in those sustainability initiatives and having that experience is gonna be really important. And then going towards the AVP academic affairs. I guess one of the big reasons why we're all here is academics. So there is a lot going on academic wise and making sure that we have a targeted person for academic affairs is gonna be interesting and very important. And then something that has come up time and time again is our satellite campuses. So suggesting an AVP of satellite campuses is going to connect our membership because I'm not sure if everyone knows, but we actually have satellite campuses um, in Saskatoon and in Prince Albert. And so these are, uh, excuse me, my voice is a little bit funny today, um, but these are um, URSU members, they're fee paying, they, um, need to be represented and understood. And then going forward, when we're thinking about the future 
of like Ursu membership, I think our members are getting more geographically distant. So ensuring that we can have that proper representation is really important. And having that connection is going to be great to all of our satellite campuses. Okay, I might leave the questions. I'm loving them. Um, actually, I'm just going to look really quick. Don't mind the quotations that make it seem vaguely passive aggressive, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I promise. No, I love that question. Um, the officers and executives, um, so that'd be the president and the VPs are board members, but um, we are going to be building in different accountability measures and we have executive reviews and that kind of stuff as well. So making sure that we can balance all of that is definitely a priority and you're really right to, to, to second guess that. Um, so we definitely have that consideration in mind. Well, and yeah, no, I'd love to hear more about that, like when it's all kind of sorted out, because I just worry, like I kind of said about like, if the officers or executives want to push something through, if they have like almost half the board, then it might get kind of iffy, like ethics wise, but I'm loving all the new VPs and AVP positions. Those are sweet. So I'm excited. Great. And also like one of our, we really did want to separate out the operations and governance as much as possible and so student unions are like beautifully unique with the executives that are like slightly operation side and slightly governance board side so that's um a really big important thing that needs to be addressed okay and perfect um tf give me some sort of signal if i'm being too slow so key proposed changes to the board. So right now the board meets roughly twice a month and in the summer months, they meet once a month. So what we're proposing is board meetings once in a month. So this is going to better suit the board function of oversight because the multiple meetings can confuse um, responsibilities. And that also sometimes leads to the board being a little bit operational when they're not supposed to be. Um, so having those meetings once in a month is also going to provide opportunities for management as well as the officers of the board to carry out um, what um, the board has asked for. And so giving proper time for that is going to reduce some of like the time crunch and that kind of burden. And so this is just better suited to the oversight function as well. It's going to reduce some of the burden of board meetings um, for our board members while also opening up different time for personal development and board development and that new training um, parts. And so we will, we are talking about increasing the honorarium for board members, but proposing that it will be given upon completion of their whole year term instead of on a month by month basis. And then we are also proposing a smaller board. Um, so, oh, I don't know the number right now, but um, it is gonna be um, significantly smaller than our current board, just to ensure that everyone can have that active participation. We can have that team bonding and um, direct management of officers. So the board would be responsible for um, the officers, which are the presidents and the vice presidents and um, the AVPs. And then um, we have this already, mandatory board training, but sometimes the execution of this is a little bit tricky just because I don't, we've found that sometimes board members don't fully understand their responsibility for like constant learning and improvement, um, as well as that foundational learning. So ensuring that mandatory board training is executed and adhered to is a really big focus as well. And Edgar, I appreciate your comment. Um, some of the decision making is going to change a little bit as well, but I think we get into that. Was there any questions on these proposed changes or comments, feedback, opinions? Keegan. Okay, so my question or comment um, is how did you 
uh, Taif and you Han and the other executive and others come up with the dis with the comment uh, with the dis discussions around smaller boards. Now I know it's this is a touchy subject because everybody wants to probably be involved, but I'm just curious how like how do you not quantify that, but how do you make those kind of decisions? I guess it's a decision that we'll just that we guess the membership will have to approve or not approve. But I'm just curious, could you explain a little bit about what that's going to look like? Of course. So TAF, jump in at any time. But just to start off, um, the smaller board, some of the positions that were previously on the board, those responsibilities and that sort of representation has been built into the AVP rules. And so um, that responsibility is going to be shifted in that direction. And then um, the student union board is interesting because um, while we provide oversight, we also provide representation. Um, so it, sometimes it can almost seem like a council, but we've seen with the smaller board that members are more engaged. They're more connected to each other. They are able to carry out their fiduciary responsibility a bit better. Um, but those were some of the key kind of feedbacks and considerations. And Tayf, would you like to elaborate a little bit more on the smaller boards? Yeah, so I will go with the, some of the legal structure. Um, so most of the um, nonprofit organization you see out there is they have a very relatively smaller board. Uh, they have eight people, six people. I see it in a couple of boards where it's seven, eight people, 10 people. The one of the main reasons to be there is board itself, we have to understand why do we have a board? A board itself in a nonprofit capacity are not representation body, are not political representation body. Rather, they're, they're the body who maintains the business of the organization. For example, budget, financial statements, operation and management, they oversight those. So there's a different levels of gover a governance, is a policy governance, another is operation governance. So a board gets involved with the operation when you have a organization probably is um, uh, very new. You just started an organization, you have $100,000 uh, your monthly budget or financial statement. Then you have to have your certain board members involved in the operation. But when a um, when an organization goes to a level where um, they are very big in, 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 in terms of the finance, then you do not have the board to involve in the operation. They just oversight the board. And then board can appoint each committee. They can decide what committee they need and then committee will do some of the work. So in our current model, we have a complex situation where um, we do not have officers. Although we have executives, the executive itself is a governing body. So just because we do not have the officers, um, so we cannot, a lot of the designated, a lot of the responsibilities we do up by ourselves, and that is um, not within the governance, um, good governance principles. For example, um, smaller decision, they should be maintained by executive or officer of the union. For example, little, little things. Um, so with this, um, um, with this new governance thing, we're gonna have um, we're gonna have the board is overseeing the organization, not directly or indirectly making smaller decisions. They will leave the res they will designate one single committee. This that is going to be an executive committee, and an executive committee will do smaller decision for the board, and they will report to the board every single uh, month. Um, so um, executive committee um, can. And they're the officers of the board, so they they will have to listen whatever board say they them to. Um, so if a board agrees on something, something executive committee cannot make any other decision, um, uh, op, you know, overstepping the board. Um, so with this new uh, model, executive committee itself is going to be a smaller kind of board. It's like a smaller size of the board. They will have a ten people in the executive committee. We'll go to the executive committee later, but it's going to be ten people in the executive committee. And five of them are the members of the board since they're elected, and five of them are not members of the board. So we have we do not want to you know go over like we have a ten executive in the board, and then we have ten board members. No, not that way. But we're keeping five members, elected uh, you know executive members, to be part of the board. But five of them are not part of the board. But they're they still are executive office. They still are the officers uh, of the board. So the board has given them some sort of responsibility they can maintain, but some sort of things they cannot make decision on. For example, finance of the org organization, hiring uh, you know a, a probably executive director, um, um, budget and lots of lots of other responsibilities the steel board overseeing them so i think that and another 
another um, reason we have a smaller bit because with the with the bigger body, you often find yourself in a position where you are not able to provide the legal um, legal education to every one of them just because we have a one year term and we're all students who are busy with our life and then um, men keeping education with the 26, 28 people is, is one of the very difficult things to do. And then with the big board, one decision can go either way. So there, there, there is a practice of slating, uh, for example, probably a group of people are slating within themselves and they're changing the board decision otherwise. Um, so that, that is gonna reduce significantly, as well as um, with the practice of other non-profit organization we have seen, um, a smaller board can do way, way better than having a, um, having a larger board. Perfect, thank you so much, Taya. And was there any sort of follow-up questions on that? Okay, I just want to clarify this. So the five execs are like the president and the VPs. And so the AVPs aren't on the board. They're executive officers. Yes. Um, so okay. since the AVPs aren't elected, they won't be on the board. Amazing. Okay, that addresses my earlier concern as well. So lovely. And oh, I have a question from or a comment. I appreciate that, Gurjinder. Um, so less representation will reduce student participation looking at the size of our membership. So um, as TAF had previously mentioned, um, most boards aren't as big as ours. Um, for example, like the University Board of Governors has about eight members, and so they are looking after such a wide variety of people as well. And then we've also transferred some of that representation from the board level into our officers of the board. So then we can have that representation in our day to day instead of just in kind of a feedback way because board members um, should do their best to stay out of operations and we are unique because we're a student union, but um, so having that representation in the day to day is going to be really important. And so it's kind of um, just changing the type of representation, um, not lessening it. And um, Danielle. Hi, Hannah. Sorry, I joined you late today. Um, so I'm just looking at your um, comment in the chat where it says you have five executive 12 faculty representatives and three federated colleges that will be a board of 20. do you have another um um visual that shows who those positions are exactly i believe we do um or you may have shown shown it earlier i just i just got in late sorry no, that is a okay. I'm so glad you could join us, even if it is late. Um, TF, do you want to go to the board composition slides? And I think um, she. Uh, I think uh, she's. Um, she, I'm sorry. She. Um, they're looking for um, something. Uh, um, number of position. I will um, stop the sharing and I'll share another um, probably a um, 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 a document, um, Excel document, and they will explain uh, what position uh, we're having right now and then what we have right now. Um, sorry, what position we're trying to be having and then what position we have right now. Yeah. Okay. So that one that we, you just had up on the screen there is great except not enough detail for me to understand what those positions actually look like yeah absolutely um we will just give me a couple seconds um i will just have that for you
um, do, do everybody, um, does everybody see my screen? So yes, um, I will go through, go through, if you see my full screen, um, I will go through some of the um, aspects of this. So in our current board of directors, um, we have a uh, here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, um, a faculty representative. Uh, but um, that is also wrong. And that's because um, we have constituent representative here, um, 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 continuing education uh, in uh, La Cité. Uh, they're technically faculties, so we cannot have them as a, as a constituent. So we have to give them as a faculty. So faculty members within this um, group will have to vote um, for, for their representation. Um, and then we have a three federal colleges. And then we have a constituent uh, representative, part-time students, women students, international students. Um, indigenous students, um, students with disability, LGBTQ um, um, students, equity and campaigns. So um, our proposal is, is uh, since we're having equity uh, advocacy and campaign ex executive right now, automatically we don't need equity and campaigns because they're, they're the board members. We do not have to have two positions for the same kind of work in the board. And second thing is, um, since we're having um, a BP of reconciliation, we do not need the indigenous students because it, we're giving them more work and then they have more capacity to do the work. And I'll explain a little bit better in, in, in terms of board representation. Uh, technically, in legal perspective, board are very busy to maintain the organization business, but very few times they find themselves uh, representing their governance body. That's a different governance structure we see in other students' union. They have a council, but at the same time, they have a, a board of directors as well. So board of directors often maintain the business of the organization. So there is a little room for them to um, kind of probably talk, uh, work for equity, work for um, indigenous students, because they're meeting probably once in a month or twice in a month, but they get very little time to work on this. But we really want to address the work uh, that's why we're trying turning this position to a um, employee position, not employee a officer's position. So they get money out of the organization as well as they get enough time to work on this issue rather than just showing up to the board meeting and um, uh, probably making decision of the conflict management of the organization. Um, so um, another aspect of changing, uh, making a smaller is um, we have uh, research um, a lot of the students organization and majority of them do not have any constituents representative just because um, they want to keep the board small and then they have a larger um, numbers of uh, members. So they um, do uh, have a faculty representative and federated college representative. So majority of them don't have, some of them have um, uh, probably, um, I think I cannot say the number, but some of them have constituent representatives since we're changing the direction more of a work-based. So we're seeing the smaller number here. Um, uh, so. Yeah, if that question to answer your yeah. question. That does, thank you. Sorry, Danielle. Thank you for that awesome question. And I think we have a follow-up from Talha. Do you wanna go yeah. ahead? Hi folks, I'm Talha, I'm the new general manager here. Um, just something around the constituency reps, just so folks have some context. Um, and again, like these are all still being, I believe going through this governance process. Constituency reps on boards are not as present in student unions because student union structures are rooted in the British uh, student union system uh, and student council system. But constituency reps are are more are becoming more common as different student unions add them to their boards for representation purposes. Uh, representation is not solved just with constituency reps, but it is a very important part of shifting cultures in particular in, in spaces where there has been a history of white supremacy. So uh, the uh, it is, I, I'm still kind of confused around whether we will have constituency reps in this model or not. So could you, could you comment on like, will we have constituency reps in the new board or are we moving strictly to just faculty reps and federated college reps uh, at, at this present time? Um, so what we have kind of come to currently is that we would not be having constituency representatives and we can, talk a little bit more about why. Um, I don't want to, I think we might have been a little bit off course, but Taya, if I'm going to do it. Um, so looking at the composition of our board over the past few years, while equity considerations are still of the utmost importance to make sure there's like marginalized, uh, historically and currently marginalized voices heard, but looking at our board composition, we see that um, there are many women involved. We see that 
say, part-time students, that fluctuates a lot between part-time and full-time students. So a vast majority of part-time students don't stay part-time students the whole time. And then building in the other representation into kind of the more um, to the AVP positions is what we were going for. And um, we also see what we define as non-traditional learners are the majority of students actually. So non-traditional learners like are groups that have like historically been marginalized from education and the trends that we've been seeing from this like our current board as well as the board over the last few years is that we have a lot of the non-traditional learners which is kind of a funny term because obviously they're making up the majority. So does that answer your question? Uh, I think this might be an ongoing conversation that we should have about constituency reps and representation in general. Uh, in any situation, uh, when creating new representation, you don't want to get rid of the old representative functions until you're sure the, the issue is solved. Um, as you noted, and, and this is just me giving commentary, I'm not really, this is the students like bylaws, y'all can do what you want. Um, it's, it's the issue of representation is that one year it might be significantly more than other years. Um, and, and the issue is that, uh, especially in a province like Saskatchewan, where you don't traditionally see diverse leadership, when opportunities are kind of changed around or moved away, you, you see like a, an engagement gap. So you don't want to get rid of positions or things like that until you're sure that these new positions accommodate your equity goals. But that being said, like these are still ongoing conversations that we can have. Of course, that sounds really good. And I think that it's also important to recognize that like faculty representatives and federated college, college representatives are responsible for um, bringing those perspectives from their whole like um, faculty. So um, there is a responsibility for faculty representatives to have like that understanding of EDI and inclusivity and like representing their members. And so a lot of diverse members. And so that is the responsibility of directors, but we'll definitely follow up again. Um, and Danielle? Yeah, I just uh, really appreciated Telha's comments. Sorry if I pronounced, you pronounced your name wrong. Okay, good. <laughs> um, yeah, like his comments are uh, bang on in terms of just ensuring that those constituent um, representatives, those voices are still in there. And I don't know if you could actually guarantee that that would be in the new board of directors titles as are because they're being elected by those faculties. So there is no way to guarantee that these constituent representatives, their voices would be heard because we don't know who they're gonna vote in. And it's one person, right? So there's a bit of caution around that whole piece. And um, I just kind of, I'm curious as to when are you looking at this? This would, I'm assuming being presented for the election in March, is that when it is? Um, yes. So we have consultations and feedback for 10 more days. Um, so if you have like a lot to say. We can sit down with TAF and I, or maybe just TAF or just me, depending on the circumstance. So we can sit down and talk about this more fully if you would like as well, like one-on-one. -on -one. But we have 10 more days of um, consultation. Okay. Can you add yeah. something to that? And TAF, yeah. So initially when we research around, uh, we actually tried to introduce five more new position member at large um, to make more representation. But we actually went back to um, the question, why do we have a board of directors? Um, could you have for management of the organization morally or do we wanna have a representation? So we had another governance model that we discussed is having a council where you have as many as representation from every side of the uh, uh, side of the society you can have, and they would uh, become a political representation of the union. And from the council, council will appoint four people, an executive five, and then two member at large will serve in the board of directors. So we also have considered, but they have also a lot of uh, cons. 
Uh, but one problem within um, our constituents right now is, um, so for example, international students. Um, so international students are supposed to be elected by the international students. Right now, we don't have any system where um, international students could be elected by the international students because everyone can vote to the international vote. For example, if I run for election for international students and then probably Hannah run, for, run against me, and if Hannah wins by a, a 200 votes, and I find myself, okay, I'm supposed to be international representative. I should be elected by the international representative. And I find themselves, Hena is voted by the local students. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of legal jeopardy for the organization to, since because we cannot, university doesn't collect or uh, share any information uh, about the ethnicity, about the origin of people's country. So it's very difficult to maintain those voting and then election. And second thing is, we're not reducing any representation in this current model. We're just shifting them to more work-based. So board is meant to be serving the organization, but our commitment to serve the members. So right now, um, we read the different, different board reports from the last few years. Uh, we have never found, very hardly we found that people are reporting something about their constituents. For example, international students are writing that, hey, we have this problem, this problem, this. So. Uh, like historically, um, so because board members are so busy with the organization business, they often find themselves not representing the international. Also, some of the members have um, um, uh, kind of given the feedback that international students probably is from certain one country. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm talking about the international, but a whole of that body is probably one person from probably focused on one single body, but we have very diverse group of students. So. For example, um, uh, LGBTQ um, uh, director, um, whoever it is, some of the LGBTQ members don't even know them who, who they are because we don't have that kind of structure to introduce them. So, so often finding a position where we're not actually representing, uh, but rather we're just filling up the board position. And for the board, um, for, for I can say um, LGBTQ plus, um, then some of the position remain always vacant. So whether or not you have this position, but they're always vacant, and that's uh, and that leads to a lot of confusion around the board, and then you have to have a lot of efforts to um, uh, fill those vacancy. So rather uh, shifting those responsibility representation to a um, elected staff, not staff, ABPs, um, so where they can directly work for the members and represent the members in a very very well structured manner. So uh, when we have a board members. We're basically asking them to work for us. But our new governance model says, hey, we're working for you because we're giving responsibility to some people so they can work for these constituents. If it is, makes a little bit sense, but we can, uh, we're having a consultation session and with Hannah and governance committee so we can talk about some of the rational and then, um, if we end up seeing that we do not, uh, we should have constituents, we will have, but we will uh, browse through uh, their, you know, um, cons and pros. Is it possible to get a little bit of an explanation? I really appreciated your explanation on that. Um, and I really am starting to understand the whole work-based board and you know, the problems with always having positions vacant and stuff like that. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, just, and this probably is because I came in late, um, just the more of the, um, what the role and responsibility, what that would look like for those executive officer positions. So I can a little bit explain how, what this responsibility will look like for executive officer. For example, um, uh, covering the indigenous students, um, student with disability, um, LGBTQ students, we're gonna separating those into two BP, two ABPs. Is ABP equity and diversity, ABP um, equity, sorry, equity, sustainability, and diversity and inclusion, as well as we have a, um, um, a BP that uh, relates to um, campaigns and advocacy. So there, for example, an ABP diversity and inclusion role is gonna be connect with the international students and then uh, have their voice and then have a meeting with them and then uh, discuss the issue with the international students. So they will work with the international office, university, address the issues with the international students, so just because they have a working hours in the office and they're paid. So this, this will ensure that they're actually working with the international students, as well as students from other uh, marginalized community. Um, same with the, uh, same with the, you know, uh, 
indigenous students. Right now we're having a VP of reconciliation. They will directly work toward reconciliation and they will work uh, with the indigenous students directly. Just because it's mandatory for their business, they have to work 30 hours, 35 hours a week. So they're actually working toward those, um, toward those issue. Same as um, uh, equity and sustainability. Equity and sustainability will make sure that we have equity consideration of all of our projects all of our accessibility consideration of all of our projects and programs. Uh, they will make sure that our policy is in line, our policy addresses those equity and sustainability. And they will be the lead of the program of sustainability program. So whatever we do in terms of sustainability, they will be the lead and they would communicate. And since we have a BP, a BP a communication and marketing, that this individual is only duty is gonna be talking to the students and spreading the words and getting their feedbacks and connecting with the students. Their only job is to do that kind of stuff. So you are having a very, um, you are having a pe person who would constantly talking to you and that makes sure a lot of the things. As well as um, since we're having, so since their BPs are appointed, right? So you can really appoint people from the constituents. For example, we're not gonna, um, sorry, we're not gonna um, hire or appoint a white person to be diversity and inclusion, because we can screen those who, who people can and they're, they're, they're occupied with the knowledge, so they can do the business of organization very easily than, than, than the board, because board is structured in a way, so a board member sit for the board meeting, make decision, go back. There's a little room for them to kind of represent and do the work for those constituents. So we're not, rep again, I just wanted to iterate the um, comment that we're not reducing any representation, rather we're shifting them to more work-based representative. So we're asking people not to, you know, we're not asking any more people to serve only for us, but we're saying, okay, we're gonna serve you from now and on. That sounds really positive. And I think what would really help people in the clarity moving forward with this new process to really, um, build the strong momentum to support it would be like the job descriptions to go with it so that people really can see those um, positive changes that you're looking at. So whenever we present these all the information and final recommendation and final documents, you are gonna see every single job description of each position, what they're responsible for, as well as we'll have a bylaws where they're legally mandated to maintain those things. For example, it is also our um, legal responsibility that our board of directors are um, uh, caring about the duty of care. They're they're very maintaining their fiduciary duty of the organization and making them understand there's legal consequences is very hard if you have a large number of people on the board. So if you have a smaller number, so they understand the legal um, our aspects of the board and they understand every business of the board. And then actual work can be done by the BPs and ABPs. And then uh, we will have, when I will go through the committees, how this all the structure will look like um, later, but we, you will be given every single information. That's going to be very, very large documents, but we want to, um, I know that in, in reality, you know, not everybody has time to go through uh, 50 pages of documents and understand, but that's why we're having this kind of consultation so we, we, we can, you know, um, get you more information and kind of explanation and Q&A session. Thank you so much. Great question, great answer. Um, I, I'm going to answer a question in the chat and then we'll go to Talha. What does reconciliation look like for Ursu in terms of that position? So we, this is a, like a consultation process, so it's very open um, to different opinions. So if you have any, we'd be more than happy to hear it. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that the information that we have found in other student unions is there has not been a VP of reconciliation. So I think this would be one of the first in Canada. And of course, like we don't know every single student union, but um, from what we found, it would be the first in Canada. So this is kind of groundbreaking and we're gonna have to define that. But um, this would be a very big job. Um, so like, of course, we're looking at like years of like systemic marginalization, um, but this would be, addressing like connecting with specifically indigenous students and doing that kind of work but also working on untangling like the structures of the university of regina but as well as all of the federated colleges so that would be like dealing with a lot of big systemic type issues and then as well making sure that um 
Ursu is really understanding reconciliation and working towards that. Um, so a lot of different um, jobs, but um, definitely open for feedback on the specifics. And um, we'll go to Telha. Do you want to take Emily first and I'll jump in after? Okay, Emily. Just something that I mentioned in the chat that um, it would be good if when you're explaining the new positions that you're proposing, I remember there was a diagram um, in, in the presentation. Do you think you could find that diagram again? Because I found that as a visual person, it, it helped me when it was up to see how many positions there will still be available for students to um, interact in Was it this one? Yes, yes, that's the one. I find that this one shows exactly where the board positions that we have currently, their roles and responsibilities are being transferred into these new positions here. Of course. And I would almost go as far to say as their roles are being expanded in this way, not completely just transferred. And um, Talha. Yeah, so two things. Uh, I wanted to go back to the constituency rep thing because I do think it's important. Um, it doesn't, it, I, I, would, I would suggest that it would be a, a bad idea to get rid of those positions until we're sure that our current governance model is working. Uh, the AVP system has, is new to many universities. Usually AVPs are, are non-voting positions that support the vice presidents in the office at most student unions. So uh, it is a it, it is a really innovative idea the way that it's being presented, um, but we it, the more we kind of like fiddle with our governance structure to make it smaller, which is nice. It makes it much easier for staff to be to to help support board because there's less folks. But it, it takes away a lot of the potential, you know. And, and and I don't want us to lose things because Ursu didn't live up to its potential in the past. This year we were able to organize like a, a big campaign for international students around tuition fees. We have a rally coming up. And a, a big part of that leadership was through Harvira, Vice President of Finance, but it was also uh, the work of our international students director. Um, we're talking about more work like that. Um, we were talking about um, a, a, a process in terms of the elections that we had talked about was figuring out appointments from like student centers such as, uh, and, and student associations. So letting FN USA appoint their own representatives to Ursus board for the two positions that were allocated towards indigenous students and from FNU. And we were talking about creating new positions for each, each satellite campus or, or, or other campus, you know, like there, there's other ways of doing it that might not take away as much representation. The other part of it is uh, no matter how much we get, we try and get away from this, the board of Ursu is always gonna be political because, you know, like even if we create a council. So if you look at student unions with councils such as the Federation of Students at Waterloo or um, the uh, uh, Brock University Students Union. The, there's always going to be, the, the, our budget is political. Everything we do is political because we're serving students. So if we, if we move around representation without first testing it and making sure it's working, that, that'll probably cause more harm than keeping the roles in and managing a little bit of a bigger board for a year or two and then removing them if we feel everything is working the way we want. Um, so that's just something to watch out for. Uh, but other than that, like this stuff looks fantastic. It's just, if we get rid of constituency representatives, it really messes with uh, kind of every direction that other student unions are moving in, in terms of equity and on the hopes that a project uh, or like a really good idea that we have works, but then we've all, Ursu has always had really good ideas that sometimes work and sometimes don't. So it might be a bad idea to remove that, something that has started working since in the last six months that, you know, in favor of something that will probably work, but we don't know yet. Thanks so much, Talha. And I've definitely seen the chat as well. So we can be looking into how we do this going forward. So I'm so glad we could have this discussion um, and hear everyone's opinions. Um, and I think we've, we're gonna have to go back to the drawing board a little bit on the constituency representatives, but that is why we have this session to 
for all of you to tell us to go back and think again. So we can do that. And TAF, whereabouts were we in the presentation? And I, I would really, really, really strongly encourage anybody who would like to speak like a little bit more on how they see the constituency representation going. Um, can you reach out and we can set something up to kind of talk it out. And so this is just to get more details, more feedback. And of course, if you um, are leading towards the less constituency representatives, you're more than welcome to have a meeting as well. But um, definitely schedule something because I think that was one of our maybe more um, controversial things that were going on. So I'm glad we could discuss. So going into standing committees. So uh, standing committees are um, part of fulfilling a legal requirement. So we have these committees that do work on behalf of the board and so the executive committee right now it's composed of the president and the three vice presidents but going forward the executive committee is going to expand to include the president the vice presidents as well as the associate vice presidents and so they're going to have there's going to be 10 all together and i think we might actually have more like written details out about this um, so the executive committee acts on the board's behalf between meetings and um, as well as the general manager has a non-voting role on the executive committee. And so these are formally structured meetings where decisions are made and as well as Robert's rules of order would be used. And if there is any sort of um, uh, issue or debate, like it definitely can go back up to the board, but the executive committee is gonna be more empowered to be making decisions. Um, and then reporting back to the board. So that's going to prevent the board from getting um, bogged down by smaller details. Question. Oh, and we'll go into the and just raise your hand with questions or throw it in the chat. Uh, we have our election and nomination committee. So this is going to be consisting of our chief returning officer, public election officer, student election officer, two appointed members at large. So that are, those are members that have, um, are students pretty much. So they haven't been um, elected to a director position. So they're just um, kind of our standard membership. And then an executive director for non-vote and they have a non-voting role there. And so that'd be kind of a facilitation type thing. And the election and nomination committee would be involved in, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so candidate uh, pre-meetings as well as uh, the different appointments. And so we were talking about appointing um, the AVPs and then um, the AVPs, <clears throat> uh, sorry, appointing the AVPs as well as uh, different positions that are not filled by the actual election. And so we have, really wanted to design this in a way that it would be harder to corrupt. Um, so we, but we also have representation for membership. So I think that this model is gonna be pretty good at reducing kind of corruptibility, but also having student member voices. And Taif, was there anything you wanted to add on this one? Yeah, so in the past, election committee faced a lot of legal lawsuit and there's a lot, lot of legal complication around this. So in the past, at some point, executive uh, members were the part of the election committee, um, general manager were part of the committee, and they messed up with a lot of the things of the election and then there were um, a lot of mismanagement. So we're keeping it in a, in a where the, um, there is a distinct, very um, experienced people in the election and then in nomination. So we do not have to complain against um, 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 hiring or uh, um, selecting someone with our own bias or anything. 
So these five individual, three students and two prof working professional come with a local, lot of legal responsibility and they will be understood what the legal responsibilities they have. Uh, and then board, uh, board trust them in a way and the board give, give their, the board designate them in a way so they understand their legal responsibility and they do the duty of the board. So uh, we will more likely not seeing any complaints around uh, making those committees. So right now we have a three people sitting in the committees, right? Uh, but with the new um, governance model, we're, uh, we're asking to have what two more position that is appointed a member at large. Executive director do not engage in any committee activities, but they do um, kind of, um, uh, as Hannah says, facilitate the, all the work. Probably they're responsible for sending out the job description, making sure people are applying uh, for the ABP's position. Um, they're collecting all this information. They're um, they're doing all kind of secretarial job for the committee, and then uh, and then actual decision were made by the five people: chief CRO, uh, PEO, student election officer, and two appointed member at large. An appointed member at large, uh, we're going to put a restriction over who has no relationship with the uh, students union at all, not being part of the any committee, not being part of the any board of directors in the past or in the present. So, uh, so they're just very distinct um, two members who, uh, and then uh, we're going to assess their ability to make decision. For example, they have experience working in, in this kind of election and nomination process where probably they're um, experienced in hiring process. But that is being to say, uh, the final decision still up to the board of directors. They are just selecting people and nominating them to the board of directors, and board of directors makes the decision uh, by themselves. And members who vote for the you know, actual candidate. So. And I see a question in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, so the executives do report to the board, and depending on what kind of decisions you're referring to. So we're really focusing on getting the board to play like an oversight and strategic vision type of role. So the board decides different budget um, considerations. So they approve like the overall budget. Um, they set the strategic direction. And so that strategic direction in, informs the budget, of course. Um, so the big picture stuff is decided by the board. And then uh, the board decides different, um, say performance indicators to then go and double check that different officers of the board are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so big financial decisions that would not be budgeted for would be um, still to the board, but um, focusing on the board as an oversight situation um, is going to reduce the board getting into operations. And so that's going to reduce a little bit of conflict. So there's still going to be a lot of accountability. But again, it's like an oversight role. And so decisions, um, I'm not 100% sure which kind of decisions um, you mean. But let me know if you have a follow up question. Okay. Uh, one of the examples could be a, a board probably decide to buy a 10 chairs uh, for the organization, right? So would board be deciding what color of the chairs they're going to buy, what company they're buying from? So board will just do the overall decision making, we're going to buy 10 chairs, but the executive committee or designated people will, will kind of make a decision what color, red or blue or green, or what company we're buying for, what sizes we're buying from. So this is kind of an example what the board will do and what the executive officer will do. But with the new system, since officers are directly involved with the board, uh, sorry, directly maintained by the board, and they have to legally do whatever boards tell them to do. So board will assess their um, uh, you know, report every single month. They will read the report and they will um, uh, make them accountable in any work they do. And since we have a 10 people in the executive committee, it's gonna be very diverse decision-making because uh, we're having people from different background and different, uh, different constituents. So um, every decision will be more um, um, kind of equitable as well as uh, more um, you know, um, um, functional than having uh, four people making decisions. Okay. Um, so the HR committee, um, this would be composed of an HR consultant. Um, historically, we have seen um, 
students being a little bit ill prepared for dealing with really sensitive HR matters. So by having that um, HR professional, they can guide and also be like a neutral third party perspective. Um, and this is also going to protect the organization from potentially like labor issues um, because, well, our staff really deserve like an amazing board that can recognize their um, strengths and also just be a good employer. So by having like a profession, an experienced professional within the HR committee, that's going to ensure fairness as well as compliance with the relevant laws and legislation. Um, so this is definitely a legal area as well. And then two members at large. So those again are uh, student members that are unelected and would be appointed. And then we have uh, two board of directors. Sorry, I'm gonna take one step back. Members at large, I think are also especially beneficial. So we can select for specific HR competencies and um, different diversity considerations. And then the board of directors being on the committee or two board of directors being on the committee is also especially important because it is a board committee um, and answerable to the board. Um, historically, the HR committee has had a bumpy road. And so this is, something that we've had to really carefully consider, but we're really open to any comments or feedback or suggestions. Or elaborations from TAF, um, but the HR committee would be um, responsible for like overseeing obviously the human resources of the organization. Um, this would relate a lot to general manager and executive directors performance and support. Yeah, there's a like, uh, quick um, uh, kind of uh, distinction is HR committee is a board committee and they will do maintain the board matters. So they will not maintain the staff matters. Still staff matter resign, relies on the um, chief of the staff, which is general, general manager. General manager will be responsible for every staff, um, you know, kind of HR things. Uh, and there is the media operational thing, whether the uh, organization go and hire a HR manager or not, but we're not suggesting anything in terms of the operation. That is only what organization needs in terms of the management. What we're doing is the board uh, HR committee is dealing with the, if anyone complains again against an executive officer, so officers. So this committee will look over this as well as the board, as well as the board appointed personal, for example, executive director and then uh, general manager. Okay, and definitely shout out questions at any time. I really hope that this is a welcoming space where any sort of questions or concerns can be mentioned. And again, schedule an appointment if you have a lot of opinions because we're really excited to hear them. And now the governance committee. So um, the governance committee consisting of the president, the VP reconciliation, two appointed directors, and two appointed members at large, and an executive director in a non-voting role. So this is a bit smaller than our current governance committee, but again, the smaller committees can uh, be a bit more agile. And I know that um, currently with some of the larger committee structures, we have crazy scheduling issues. Um, so I think that that is going to fix that a little bit. And I also think that the VP reconciliation being involved in this committee is really important because we do see governance being like a tool of like colonialism. So ensuring that we can um, make our practices more equitable equitable and just is going to be really important. And questions? And the search committee. So um, the search committee being composed of the president, the VP internal affairs. So again, the VP internal affairs um, kind of is replacing VP operations and finance, but internal affairs includes um, like the money stuff and the HR stuff. And then the AVP diversity and inclusion. So that's going to ensure that we have those diversity and inclusion considerations when we are undergoing a search, as well as two appointed board of directors and two appointed members at large. 
and TF, um, do you want to elaborate a little on what the search committee does? Sure, thank you. So you have probably, you have seen a lot of, um, there is a term is to appointed member at large. Um, so you might have a question, how does member at large are gonna be appointed? Um, so because we need a committee or we need an individual to do search. So historically, if we found that uh, it might be controversial, membership might have some confusion around uh, having one person selecting everybody. So we kind of designed it in a way, it's a, we still need say um, standing committees for the searching of the candidates whenever our board needs. So that committee will search candidate for executive director, general manager, and then it will search for every member at large for city, uh, to be seated in the, in, the, in the committees of the organization. So whenever the organization starts its operation in May 1st, so the committee will be composed, um, a committee will be you know, um, uh, composed and they will start searching for a position to be filled um, in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in the role for, uh, for standing committees. And they will, if any time, for example, um, the uh, committee organization needs to find a um, executive director, the committee will actually do the hiring process and they will search a candidate or two of the candidates. And they will explain to the board of directors their strength and weakness and everything, and they will give it to the board of directors to appoint someone. So they have no decision-making power, but they do the process of hiring or appointing. Perfect. Thank you so much, Taf. Any questions? Gurjinder, <laughs> I actually had asked the same question. Um, that's a, that's a really funny question. Uh, but yes, Taf, go ahead. Sorry, do you see Gurjinder's question? So um, every um, outgoing committee, uh, whenever they're done, so this this committee will be searched. So. Every outgoing committee will search, uh, um, a search uh, in a member at large for the search committee. Um, when uh, when the committee is, so we'll try to make sure that before May 1st, we have everything set up. So outgoing committee will always do the perform from the next, um, next board and when the next board will come and they will start the operation. So it's gonna be the outgoing search committee who will do, but it's gonna be a little bit changes the first year just because, and then uh, the, the board will actually, since it is not effective until the May, if it is passed, the board will actually create an advisory committee temporarily to appoint a um, uh, appoint couple of people for the search committee initially. But once it is running after one after one year, it's not gonna make any difference. But it's gonna be a little bit changed in the first year. Hey, and uh, Danielle. Sorry, um, so you said uh, a committee is going to be created to find out those members at large. Who will have the final say on those? Will that be the board of directors then? Yes. Okay, thank you. Sorry, the dogs. Okay, going into, um, I believe, what is the last committee. Um, so finance, audit, and risk committee. So this would be consisting of the president, the VP internal affairs, the AVP equity and sustainability, three appointed boards, board of directors, the GM and accounting manager in a non-voting capacity. Um, so this committee would be responsible for different budget items as well as helping out with the audit because um, we get audited every year, which is really good and in compliance with the law. Um, and something that um, more and more boards are starting to consider is the risk aspect. So that risk relates to different cybersecurity concerns, as well as privacy and uh, data integrity. And so having that function built in as well is gonna be really important as the world is increasingly digital. And again, this is oversight, but um, there is a lot of risk with different um, cyber issues. And so like, I'm not even gonna talk about it, like knock on wood, but um, the finance audit and risk committee is kind of, that's what they would be doing. And Danielle, is that your hand up from before? 
Or is there another question? Sorry, that was from before. <laughs> okay. Okay, Articles of Incorporation. So this is, are we going to do a screen share and show them? Yes, we will. So the Articles of Incorporation um, are what brings us in compliance with the Nonprofit Act. Um, so that's gonna be really good. And it's just gonna provide like different definitions and clarifications on what things mean. if you're bringing that up right yes apologies please give me a couple seconds okay sorry <laughs> i'm just trying to find it Ooh, this anticipation. Now everybody's excited for the Articles of Incorporation, right? <laughs> Can I share my screen? That's the um, sentence of the year. Do you guys see my screen? <laughs> okay. We don't yet, just so you know. <laughs> no, I have one actually. There you go. There it is. Um, okay. So, um, sorry, go ahead. You I'm take sorry. this one, Taya. Do you, uh, you can go ahead, that's fine. I will probably add if there is a need. Is there a way you can make it a little bit um, bold or something? Is it better? Yeah, a little. Uh. I'll verbally explain so it will be uh, easier. If, if there still needs to be explained something, you just um, let me know. So um, artic restated articles of incorporation, very sound, very fancy what it is. Um, so <laughs> articles are, the, are, are, are in a set of articles that is required by the act. And uh, as a nonprofit incorporated organization, we're required to have and uh, have sets of articles and articles are the formal, they define formal structure of the organization. Um, so those are, uh, those are just in, those are required you to be incorporated legally as an non profit organization in Saskatchewan. So different provinces have their different legislation and the different requirements, but uh, we have our requirements set uh, outlined in Nonprofit Corporation Act 1995. And these articles were written according to the act. So in our previous, you probably haven't seen articles of incorporation in our um, in our uh, directly document, but what we do have is a constitution. Our constitution outline our articles, but they're they're you know all over the place. With we including our bylaws, and that makes things a little bit complicated because if you want to change the articles, you need a two that majority vote with the notice with the members in a board in a general meeting. But for the bylaws, it just needs simple majority. But in the past, what we had is we probably changed the articles and made amendments, but we never really um, yeah, were, were in line with the Nonprofit Corporation Act, as well as uh, we haven't made any amendments to the articles for, for many, many years. So that puts us in a very legal um, a complication. That's why our legal counsel a uh, couple of years ago, and then a lot of legal work, um, the people said that according to, to be according to the act, we need to restate our articles to a separate documents, and then we need to create the bylaws of the organization in a separate documents. So this is a very formal structure of the organization, 
and that outlines what organization will look like you know, structurally with the Nonprofit Corporation Act. They, these articles are not to be changed every year and not to be changed probably in five years, unless there is a change in terms of the members, in terms of the directors, um, then you, you can change it. But when you change it, uh, we need a special resolution in, in a general meeting and then we need to amend the articles um, to the ISC um, uh, and then uh, we also need a notice of the member directors as well as notice of the members. So there are some, there are some legal requirements. Um, so in the beginning, you see some definition of what the act means. Act means uh, Non-Profit Corporation Act 1995. Uh, organization means Students Union of the University of Vagina Incorporated. Um, directors mean the board of directors of the Students Union of the University of Vagina Incorporated. Um, director means means a general member of the organization who's elected or appointed to serve on the board of directors. Officers means the elected or appointed members of the organization who hold offices. So there are basic articles that every organization, non profit organization have to have in, in, in Saskatchewan. First is entity. So what's the name of our organization, legal name, and what is, uh, what is our entity number? So you see, those are the uh, two things. Uh, name of our organization shall be known as Students Union of the University of Vagina Incorporated, but we can call in a different name in our um, non-legal you know, ways. So we can say University of Vagina Students Union. That is not problem. But when we do some legal uh, thing, legal aspect, we have to use our legal name of the or organization. Daniel, I can answer your question before we move on. Yeah, is that um, entity number, is that like the similar to uh... The, your non-charitable status number is that what that's referring to or is this specific to the act itself so when you incorporate an, an organization with the uh, with according to non-profit act to the isc they will provide you an entity number so that that established that you were incorporated legally standing organization in, in saskatchewan okay so that's the incorporation number from referring to the act Okay, so the non-charitable number would be separate from. Yes, yeah, so I think charitable um, number is um, uh, provided with the um, uh, uh, with the C is, um, what was the name? Um, Canada Revenue Agency, uh, but I I'm not entirely sure if we have a charitable number. Um, I think our accounting manager, if he's there, or Talha can probably explain. We if we don't have a charitable number because we're a nonprofit, so. We're not a charity. We don't get we don't get to give out tax receipts or anything like that. But we are a nonprofit, which has other rules. As I'm so sure. the other thing is um, we are also a membership organization. Um, most charities um, are open to all sorts of people and aren't membership organizations. And the membership organization specifically excludes us from having a charity number. Does that question answer your question, Daniel? Yeah, much more clarity around that. Thank you. Not a problem. Thank you for asking that. Um, so another article that you acquired is registered office. What, where do we have our registered office? Isn't it situated in the city of Regina? Um, so that is that wasn't changed. Um, so we're still in Regina. We're, we haven't moved to Saskatoon. <laughs> so uh, and then next article is very important. It's going to be membership class. Since we're uh, I will go another art, uh, article here is uh, corporation type is that we're membership type corporation as uh, Nick mentioned. We're based on membership. We're built and governed by the membership. So um, membership class. So there shall be two classes of membership. Right now we have a one class of membership and another class was introduced before, but haven't been approved by the membership um, uh, for, for many different reasons. But it was introduced in a way that uh, honorary membership will be given that kind of um, um, authority or coming, they can come to the meetings, speak to the meeting, submit to the proposal, but only they cannot devote in the, in the meetings and general meeting and then election. But we have done a lot of consideration and a lot of the needs were met in the honorary membership. So some of our members, um, they pay four years or five years or more than five years our in, um, students union fees. And probably after completion of their degree, they find themselves in a way they need some support in terms of um, food security. They haven't probably found a job or uh, they need some access to our services. And um, they request in, in the past uh, to, for example, um, access to our pantry. So since they have 
had they have have been our members for four or five years we still have some responsibility morally to look after our members who just have been graduated or have graduated a couple of years ago if they find themselves in a position where they're struggling with their personal lives um, with the food and other things so we are introducing another class of membership that's going to be honorary membership so i will Kind of explain what honorary membership will be a little bit later, but we're still kind of you know um, in a, in a, in a part where we'll be writing in the bylaws how the honorary membership will look like and how we will define them. So regular members, all students enrolled for credit, non-credit, or audit at the University of Jana or any of its affiliated colleges. They include satellite campus, they include federal colleges, everything, who pay the required fee. So if if a particular uh, faculty or something doesn't pay, the, for example, ESL, they do not become automated member of the organization. But we are in this new um, um, new um, uh, governance model. We're trying to address those students who are probably um, um, ESL students, but they still need to be supported and represented at the university. So we will go ahead and do some manual membership um, um, options for them as well, and then. Honorary membership, all former students of the University of Jana um, or affiliated college uh, may be conferred. So it's, there is a things to understand, may be conferred honorary membership in accordance with bylaw of the organization. So they're not automatically given the membership. They may be conferred. That means um, they will have to apply for a membership. So we will give them a form and then we will ask some question why they need to be part of the members. And then they will um, give, uh, uh, they will put all the information and board of directors will assess whether or not they shall be given the membership based upon the needs uh, for them. So board of directors will, will provide membership to them with a membership card. So if, they, if they're approved, they will give the membership card. With this card, they can access like a pantry. Uh, they will have to show the card that, hey, I'm honorary membership, they will be at they will be accessing uh, the services. I see a question from the Keegan. No, you just answered it. I was going to just ask, what would the benefits be of an honorary member? But I think you just mentioned it. So, so required by the law legislation, if we have a more than one class of membership, we have to define what the rights and privileges of each class is. So this is where it defines in section three, four and section um, um, three, five, sorry. So regular members can attend, may attend, speak, submit proposal, and vote in general meetings of the members. That means AGM and SGM. Um, vote in all referenda and election. So they can vote in all referenda elections. Attend, speak, and submit proposals at the meetings of the director. So they, they can come to the director's meeting and they can attend, speak, and submit proposal. But please note, they cannot vote in the board of directors because they're not directors but they can do otherwise every other things. Become a director or officer of the organization and have responsible access, reasonable access and use of the facilities of the organization. So they're legally bound to use some of the um, facilities. For example, if a member comes to the woods and said, hey, I need to uh, use your office, use your chair for five minutes. And if someone says, no, you cannot, not now, now, because it's COVID regulation, but normally if someone comes and they're denied, they're legally obligated to receive those uh, facilities as per the, um, our articles. Um, honorary membership shall have reasonable access to some services of the organization, not everything, because some of the services are related to our current members and we're, we have an agreement with this kind of way. We have to serve the students with some of the third parties. So some services, for example, like care spending, community fridge, clothing program, and if we have any future program that we introduce can be accessed. And then um, events of the of, our, of the organization, for example, we're inviting a MLA or sorry, a senator from the uh, from somewhere, and then uh, they can access to these um, services without paying any fee, just because they're the honorary members. And the second clause is um, not be enti um, entitled to any privileges outlined in subsection three and four. So whatever outlined in here. They, for example, they cannot vote, they cannot submit, they cannot attend uh, the, the AGM, SGM, and, and then and, and board of directors just because they are not a regular class of members. I'll get a question um, from um, Keegan and then I'll move it to the next article. Yes, uh, thanks. I just was curious in the regular members uh, descriptions, 
there isn't anything, well, maybe we could argue about reasonable access, but I mean, there isn't anything about funding. Now, I do think that that might be something to consider because I think there's a lot of students, there's a lot of whatever, honorary students, hypothetically, that per, per, could produce good quality work. And I think that that could, so I'm just thinking, have you considered financially fin, uh, finances or PEC funding or whatever, some kind of like, the, I just was curious because like grad students, I know they have their own student uh, association or society. I think there's stipulations where they can provide funds or they can get funds from that association, but not from ERSU for PEC funding or something like that. So I'm just was curious, have we considered providing opportunities for research and engagement uh, for graduated students or whatever? Yeah, do you wanna go ahead, Hannah? Oh, I just wanted to mention that, um, I guess this answers Keegan's question as well as uh, Gurjinder's in the chat, that um, the details of this would be put out in bylaws, if I'm not wrong. Um, so in, in terms of like the specific services that like are able to be accessed, because um, if we put that in the articles of incorporation, and then for some reason, like one of our services doesn't continue, it just gets weird. Um, but having that in the bylaws that can be a little bit more easily changed is the approach we were going to take on that. Um, and um, this was actually a, a very big conversation during different consultations about what services um, should be accessed like accessible for honorary members. And some of our logic and discussions had been around um, like making sure that we can serve like current students consistently as well. So while like all of the honorary members are former students and have contributed and might be paying like a small fee, making sure that we still have those resources available for students, uh, current students is really important. And then um, also like the honorary membership, I think um, the services that we had talked about being provided were kind of like necessity type services. So um, making sure that like people have like food or clothes um, kind of, we had discussed more so like the Ursu Cares services would be available. Um, because honorary members aren't going to be paying that same fee as current members in our pre preliminary discussions, but that's definitely a conversation. TF, did I answer that well? Yeah, so before we go to further question, I'm going to highlight. Um, so ESL students, the problem with the ESL is the university doesn't collect students union fees from the ESL students. That's why they do not become automatically member for our organization. But what we're trying to do is now ESL students can now um, come to the front desk and pay the required fees. Um, and then we have to evaluate the policy, how much a fee they can, because they're not taking any credit classes. So they can pay required fee and they will be given membership and they can access to everything like a regular members. Uh, but that's gonna be a manual process just because the university doesn't collect anything from the ESL for the membership. And will the services be highlighted? Yes. So the articles are things is a very broad. So it's a, it's a matter of legal interpretation of the article. So you cannot highlight the smaller details in the articles because you wanna give the room for interpretation and making some changes. So those highlight will be either in the bylaw or in the policy. So we'll um, describe how, what services they can and cannot access in the policy or in the bylaw. Can I jump in? <laughs> Okay, so um, the, the services are going to be outlined clearly in the bylaw or, or whatever other document you have there that's a possibility. Um, so are we going to have something in within this particular document under that section 3.5 there that will state that it refer to this documents so that there's there's clarity around somebody just looking at this and not being able to see that oh i have to refer to this other document now yeah we can in the section subsection subsection a we can probably include according in accordance to the bylaw or policy of the organization so we can e easily include that so uh, this is kind of a draft so we're still going yeah, back and forth bad. and i appreciate your um eu and gurdinder for for that small context it's very helpful yeah Thank you.
do not have any other question, I'll move into the next article. The next article is corporation type. I will, if there's nothing to discuss, if we're membership, we're not charity organization. Um, there are typically two type of organization. One is charitable, one is membership. Um, so we're, we're membership type organization. That means we carry on activities primarily for benefits of its members. Um, so we do within whatever our members needs. We do not go outside and do something for city of vaginas, for example. Uh, we do for our members. Authorized number of directors. So that is uh, something a legal requirement, how many members at least you can have and how can a maximum you can have. The organization cannot go like over the limit or under the limit. So maximum we can get at 20 people in according to our new governance. But if we have to choose the constituents, we have to include, you have to increase this number, but that is up to the discussion with the consultation later, we'll make a change. But minimum is four, just because we have a, um, a minimum is eight. So if any time organization come to a point where they have less than eight members, they have to call an SGM right away um, um, and then they can, uh, they have to figure out, um, they have to appoint people to be the board of directors, but with less than eight members, they cannot operate anything for the organization. Legally, at least they cannot. So they have to call for an STM and that requirement is outlined in the Nonprofit Corporation Act. Right to transfer membership interest, uh, none. So we do, not, we do not put any right for any people to transfer their membership interest to any other person. Um, so that is very widely um, available to any other organization. They do not, but some organizations do, but non student senior. So we have a new article, there's a restriction on activities. So um, we, um, we're membership type organization. We want to benefit our members. Uh, and then we want to be, we want to be politically representative, but at the same time, we don't want to be partisan representative. So we put a restriction on the organization that organization must not participate, organize, fund, or promote any partisan activities or activities that produce hatred toward any human group. So there is a wording, some sort of consideration we have had, human group, what does it mean? That means we did not want to put it into very specific because specific can be interpreted very heavily and that could uh, lead us to a legal complication. So we kept it in a legal interpretation way. So human group means any human groups. They could be black, indigenous, um, they could be Caucasian, they could be other human group. If someone, for example, uh, we, we have a very good um, conversation around is, um, Israel and Palestine issue. Um, so if someone support uh, Palestine as a state and they, they deny the Israel, that doesn't mean they're partisan. They mean they're, they're just politically representing a, 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 a cause. So there is some uh, legal interpretation you have the room for. Um, then we have a dissolution provision. So that's that's the one dissolution provision required by the act. So what if your organization um, is in a position where corrupted is not able to run any any sort of it, if anything comes, if the dissolution if anything comes. So in our current thing that has been there for last probably many, many decades, and it is available in most of the students union and majority, but we're, we're still, it's, it's a discussion. Who shall we, um, give uh, put in the trust of our assets and then all the things so in the normal practice every organization it just give to the board of governors that doesn't mean we sell them to the things what it means we put them in the trust so board of governors will find a relative in a you know uh, uh, so it defines in the, in the article they will find a similar kind of organization or similar kind of student representatives and they will um, try it. They will ask them to form a student union or any sort of other student representation. When that is established, they will move and they will shift all of the assets and um, uh, everything of the organization to them. They're legally responsible, so they cannot seize us anything. Um, okay, I will go to Talha's question and then we'll come back. Uh, not a question, just a comment on these two clauses specifically. Late last night, I did send Taya some, some details around the dissolution clause. Um, just for your folks' information, uh, there are a lot of student unions that put this type of verbatim language in their in their constitutions or bylaws, especially in the West, uh, specifically Alberta and Saskatchewan. But because of some of the issues that student unions faced in the 90s, a lot of the other more, I say advanced more in terms of their history, more advanced student unions such as the UB, uh, the Alma Mater Society of the University of British Columbia uh, and others, um, changed around this language so that the assets or fees don't go to the Board of Governors of the University of Regina, but rather either go 
to some other student organization that can hold it in trust until a new student unit is established or, uh, or to charities that fulfill the other objects of our organization. So for example, if the AMS of UBC ever dissolved, they would give that money to charities that do the work that the AMS is supposed to do. So probably like student welfare and things like that. Um, the reason for that is just that uh, there's a very, uh, it's a very deep imbalance between students and the university. So in the God forbid situation where Ursu has to dissolve or liquidate, um, whenever a student union liquidates for any reason, so in Quebec, there's a lot of students that just dissolve themselves because they thought uh, student revolution would happen and students would just take over everything. Fun fact, that didn't happen. Or if they dissolve for other reasons, um, it was many years until another student union was formed. So these having that money sit in trust means there's no power for students to come together to kind of create that student union. And if the university is holding on to it, they might be able to set different um, limitations on what that student union looks like because the new students who are trying to organize need access to funding and resources to create a student union. So it's better for a clause like this to focus on giving these funds to another student union in trust before we liquidate or as we liquidate or some other group that we can trust to immediately uh, provide to, uh, that funds to whatever new student group that exists. For me, something I was thinking about is one of the strengths of the University of Regina is in our service centers and our student organizations, such as ARPERG. It would be, it would probably be a good idea for those organizations if URSU, again, God forbid, was to <laughs> dissolve for the service centers and student organizations on campus, those that are nonprofits and legal organizations, uh, to hold it in trust. And, and that would give them the reason, like, those would probably be the student leaders that would help recreate a new URSU. Um, in terms of the clause before this around limitations, the partisan part is good, but the language is a little awkward around uh, human groups and things. And like, I, I get the, the reason for why that language was used, but we might have to massage that to fit, I mean, more appropriate language that fits what you're trying to say. Uh, but other than that, the, in particular, the dissolution clause, I just found that research very late, so I couldn't send it to you folks early but I did send that to Taya very late last night. Thank you, Delha. Um, so this, uh, in the article um, three, so this is this is to keep right is a board interpretation, but organization can may or may or may not introduce any policy or around any, um, um, any kind of um, um, rights of the students or something, they can publish those kind of things outlining what those means and what it doesn't mean. So you will also want to keep a, a room for legal interpretation. For example, you can go to the court and then you can say, okay, this is what we mean and this is what we refer. So your your weeks is significantly lesser if you put in a generic uh, context of the articles, but Again, I appreciate um, the things and we will discuss with everything later in a day in a consultation and make sure that everything things. Uh, with the article uh, nine, uh, yeah, there are some good uh, sides and uh, bad sides of having this one. So I, I've got uh, a Talha's one and there's very much um, a good insight in something. And then I will um, talk to with this governance committee with the Talha and uh, uh, other students in large and probably consider uh, making some of the changes. But I just wanna kind of um, mention one thing with this one is, um, in a legal perspective, you can only put in the trust to any group that is similar size or even greater size. So an organization like ARPARC cannot legally hold in trust just because they're very small. They do not have any legal capacity to get all the liquid you know, uh, assets and something. And finding those group in on campus is gonna be a little bit complicated because we do not have the same size organization. So I also would wanna to go like, you know, um, think about this side also if we were making changes to this um, uh, dissolution because it's legally required that we have to give to the trust to same similar size or bigger size. So since also we're membership of the organization of the University of Vajana, uh, we technically are not able to go to put in the trust for the, for, for example, in Ontario, any organization. Um, so there is another thing to consider uh, if you're making the, some changes, but we will talk about this specifically later in a date. So um, other provision that is, that is not entirely required, that's an optional, if you would like to put in the articles, but there, these are also I mentioned in the, in the bylaws in a very broader way. But those are things you wanna keep as it is organization. You don't want an organization to be changed over the years. You wanna keep it consistency of the organization that we have a director, 
must be a regular member of the organization of the first one. So if you're having a director, any non-member cannot be a director. Any ordinary member cannot be a director of the organization. That's a legal requirement that we have. Um, objectives of the organization is um, organization is committed to represent, you know, you can probably read it later, but educational interest of the you know, members and stuff. Um, so I want to emphasize on the objective principles. So these are not necessarily what the organization is supposed to be as an organization, rather be this is the things what connection between the members and organization look like. Uh, in a legal perspective. So we can and may, and we should have a strategic planning and then have our mission, vision and other objectives of our organization passed every five years or three years and we should publish it to the, our members as well as we should also define some of the things in a bylaw so that bylaw can be changed every year. Some of the things that we need to change but just because we're not making changes to the article and who shouldn't make changes to the article every year. So we're keeping it very broad and very unique thing that organization is is meant to be. So uh, we have our principles um, is to treat all the members of the organization equally regardless of the race, um, age, religion, creed, color, place of national origin, um, socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, political views, martial uh, status, educational interest, and disability. So this um, clause means if any time any member find themselves being treated poorly or there is a racial things involved, they're legally obligated to, uh, uh, to go um, file a complaint against the organization because we outline in our articles and that is the legal document. So you have the right to complain if, if the organization makes, you know, uh, you know, treats you any, any, any different just because your race and color, your gender and sexual orientation. Uh, also, that provide freedom of information in all activities of the organization, exempting where it does information is contribution of any laws, statute, compromi compromises, and what was the um, negotiation in progress. For example, it, it might be a little bit complicated. For example, there is a um, human resource complaints going on against a, um, against the uh, executive. So just because you have um, the freedom of information, so if a human resource things going on, there is. Um, uh, that is under, you know, um, under negotiation that cannot be shared with the members can never be just because it's a HR matters. Um, if there's something going on an executive session of the board of directors meeting that cannot be shared with the members, but other than that, um, any, for example, there is a legal suit go, uh, lawsuit going on with the organization that cannot be shared with the members unless it is sold. So it's a legal requirement that you do not share any information uh, while this is in progress. So unless after it's sold, organization can submit a form or whatever documents they get uh, to the membership for explanation. So other than that, for example, uh, board of directors meeting minutes, agendas, a board of directors meeting access to the board meetings, um, committee, uh, standing committees uh, uh, minutes and other all other documents of the organization. For example, you can ask the organization to provide you um, for, for example, monthly financial information. An organization is bound legally to provide you the information at any time uh, when they have. They can also say like, hey, uh, probably we'll, we're preparing two days later. We'll provide you two days later or something. That's kind of flexibility they have, but they must provide you whatever you ask if there's um, reasonable, um, you know, uh, it is um, in the articles. And another clause is to be duty, duty bound to uphold and honor all laws and statutes governing the operation and extent, uh, extensions of an organization. So if an organization in AGM or SGM or something mess up and then oversee the act that we have, Nonprofit Corporation Act, it is not legal and any member can uphold and then uh, make the organization um, um, uh, accountable. So we have our act, the top, we cannot supersede the act, we cannot, and then uh, our bylaws cannot supersede the articles and our policy cannot supersede the bylaw. So there is a kind of hierarchy uh, level. So we have to maintain those kind of um, laws and statute. And the laws and statute also means some um, human resource law that we have in Saskatchewan. We have other um, laws that you have Saskatchewan. We have to be legally bound as an organization to that. That concludes our articles. Uh, we will get to question and answer and then we have our next item to move on.
Jenny. Yes, I have one final question regarding this. Um, uh, reinstated the articles of incorporation. Will we have a final review of this once, because I recognize this is just a draft. So a final review of this before? Yes. Yeah, so, okay. um, you will be given everything in advance as well as when the um, board of directors call for an SDM, they're legally bound as per our new constitution to give you at least 15 days of notice and they will have to include all the documents uh, with the notice. So you will have another 15 days before the STM to go through all of the things and then make um, some of the consideration. Okay, thank you. So there is a question that Muhammad asked, uh, what the expected timeline in terms of the next steps for this process. So uh, we are um, listening for the consultation up till next 10 days. And then in between, uh, we will submit to the final recommendation to the board of directors. Board of directors will have a chance and they will approve or either amend or either reject. Um, it's up to the board of directors because uh, we're just a working group and then they will make their final decision. If board of directors approves, that means they also have to call for an SGM. And that is, I, I believe, within that um, uh, by 30th of this month. Okay, um, I will stop sharing and then um, go to a, back to our presentation. I'll, I'll give the mic to the Hannah. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much, Taf. So we've had a really full session already, but we're not done. So um, was there any sort of comments or questions or even ideas like um, and again, I have encouraged everyone um, to set up a session if you want to sit down um, with Taya for I or a whole governance committee. Um, so I have been setting that up with a couple people throughout this session. Um, but we want to hear about it now as well, because I think that we can all kind of think better and explore ideas as a group and bounce off one another, but open discussion. Hey, Keegan. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Hannah, Taif, and everyone else who have been doing the great work with this reform or this or these uh, with these uh, with the reform and uh, consultations. You both and everyone who's involved have been doing a really great job. And I know it takes a lot of effort and skill to present a three-hour, almost a three-hour meeting. So thank you. I'm just curious. Uh, not that faculty and professors and people like that are are members of our organization, but I'm just curious, besides probably talking to like senior leadership, have you just spouted some ideas with faculty and deans and stuff about URSU, ref not reform, but URSU consultation and what they might bring to the table? So we haven't done um, extensive uh, consultations with upper um, administration. Um, so of course we do have like different considerations and we've like let them know what's going on. But then in terms of faculty representation and opinions, I always find that interesting because I do think that um, some, a lot of the faculty or, or uh, university staff are longer around longer than we are. Um, but TF, do you want to make a comment on that? Yes. So as part of our, if you remember, if you recall what we uh, presented in the last um, town hall, either we said we're going to consult uh, with the people with the relative experience. So um, as a uh, it's a membership organization, so we um, we want to emphasize on members more, but at the same time with the legal requirements, because bylaws and articles are the legal thing. And if I mess up with something or some someone else in our committee mess up, that's a problematic. So I've been to, um, and then that's part of a private consultation but so that I cannot name any name who I've talked to, but I can say we have met um, a graduate, stu a graduate studies professors. We have also met uh, a people who are um, being in a 
governance sector for many, many times. We also have met consultants from community uh, who have uh, been in the board on many different sectors for many, many years. And then we have given them some of the, uh, I have openly explained them what's the problems we have in our governance. And then they have, we have also given them a solution. This Is this a good way to move forward or something? And uh, all of this proposal we have sent is kind of uh, collectively approved by everyone that we have talked to. Um, so we have considered many, many, many areas of the governance. We considered having uh, more people in the board, having less people in the board. We considered having uh, non-members on the board. We have considered making a professor director of the board. Um, so when I submit the final final um, report, I'm going to mention what we have considered. There's like thousands of things of consideration, but we have come to a point where uh, that relates to everyone's need. And uh, Danielle. Hopefully this is my last question or comment. <laughs> Um, I've not been a part of any of your town halls previous to this. Um, so are your presentations, like your PowerPoints that you have here, are they on your website somewhere where I can access them and go back and, ref you know, read through it and get a really clear picture? So we have documented quite a bit on our website, but I'm not 100% certain if it was the specific slides, but we still have access to those slides and can send them to you directly from our last town hall. That would be awesome. I greatly appreciate that. And I believe we have a recording as well. Awesome. Um, so we'll track that down and um, we're going to connect as well. So we'll be able to get that to you. And are consultations documented and will they be public? Great question. Um, so TIFF will have more details on this, but um, just with the sensitivity of the different consultations, some people did request to like not be named, um, but the benefit of having an employee do this versus an elected official means that there's a lot of, um, not bias things happening. So we have made that consideration and we would be making as much as possible public um, because throughout this whole process, I think there's been a lot of transparency and clarity about what has gone on. So we'll make everything as much as possible transparent, but we do also have to respect the wishes of some individuals. But TF, did you wanna be more specific about the one-on-one -on -one consultations and stuff? Will that be public? Yeah, so we're going to have a collective response of individual issue, like individual issue. We're going to mention what the issue was and what, why have we come to a point where we, we think this solution is better than others. We're going to compare in comparison for other things. Um, we're going to share all this consultation, all these um, things with you. That is, uh, that is one of the main objectives we had with this consultation process. We're going to share every single detail, but we're not going to name any name. For example, who do we, did we contact? And uh, if some people agreed to be uh, you know, named, we will mention their name. For example, we have talked to the FNU Student Association. Uh, we talked to specifically Amanda, and she said she was fine, and she endorsed our new plan. So we will be mentioning this. But if someone said, for example, there's a lot of people requested a lot of the things from the membership. Um, so um, some of the things, if we say to you directly, you're going to be like, angry and outrageous, but they still have a reasonable request. So we considered their request as well. It's not that we didn't consider, we consider all of the requests, but with the, you know, avoiding the conflict, some of the personal requests won't be shared, but every single details other than personal will be shared with the members. More questions and discussion. 
Ooh, I have one, and it might be good for everybody to know. Uh, so, Taif and Hannah, what are the next steps before this is brought to students at the special general meeting? Absolutely. I'm not gonna have the dates on the top of my head, um, but um, so we're gonna be doing consultations for about 10 more days, and then it will be brought to the board. And I guess one other specific step we're gonna take is um, further consultations and then a recommendation from the governance committee. And so this is not like, this is just to create a document that the governance committee like all can endorse and get behind. And then that's sent to the board. And then if the board approves it, then um, they would be calling for a special general meeting. And then um, if the if the special general meeting was passed, um, then we would be hosting it. And that would be really similar to our AGM. So a lot of people were at our annual general meeting, but that would mean a meeting of more than a hundred people, I believe, or more than a hundred members are uh, all there. And then we do some voting. And I guess it will be to be decided if it's in person or online. And I think it's also really important to stay in touch with the student union throughout this whole thing. So email me, call me. Uh, Danielle? I really applaud you guys. This is quite an ambitious project you have undertaken this year. Um, and I'm assuming all this is, is the build up to have this all passed before the next AGM so that this is all in place. You guys are amazing. Very impressed. Thank you so much. But I think like it's also really important. Well, okay, TAF deserves a crazy round of applause, but I also think that none of this would actually be possible without our members. And so a lot of people have stepped up for like no reason, just because they wanna do something great and they want to shape their student union. So I think that a lot of our members deserve a ton of recognition because like we couldn't do this without all the conversations and the discussions and obviously our members are so busy so I think that we're just really grateful for you all for wanting to make the student union something that serves us all. And Keegan. Yeah, uh, the last comment for me is uh, I suggest that when you present this to the board you I, I'm sure you're going to put a lot of effort into it. I know that, but I mean, I, I really strongly suggest that it's more than a 15 minute presentation like is usually allotted because this is really important stuff. And so I think that that's really, so I just think that have, we don't have like a five hour meeting, but just, I think it's really good because like, for instance, there's some people on the board that have it and it's fine, but they have, some of them haven't been a part of the town halls and stuff. So if you want to really sell what we're, what you all have been doing and what, I think that that might be a suggestion that I would throw out there. Absolutely. That is really important because it's needs to be like discussed fully and understood fully and making sure that our board um, understands the suggestions and then also making sure that we can like accommodate everyone's needs and everyone's wants into it. So exactly because I think that last thing I just say is that I think that it would be a shame for it for the board not to pass like I know we're not you're not telling us telling the board what to do but I just think it would, with all the work and effort you put in it would, I would hate for the board not to pass the, the work the, this discussions when everybody's put so much time and effort into it just because some person might not really have a good enough understanding so as long as it takes I, I think that as long more discussion and more uh, thoughtful discussion at the board level, and I'm sure we will do that. I think that's really important. Absolutely. Um, and board members have been updated like frequently since I believe middle of September about this. And then, so we've been doing updates at every board meeting, and we have also been emailing our, all of our directors and reaching out. And actually, some of you will see a direct message from me bugging you to get your opinion. So engaging with the board before the meeting, but also at the meeting is really important. And Taya, did you have a comment? 
Yeah, so um, I also wanted to make sure every step of the level that uh, we engage the board of directors. So I personally email multiple, multiple times um, just because they can get more information out of these kind of town halls and private meetings. So we will ask the board of directors before submitting to them, hey, um, there is a, uh, so if you are not a person to read all of the things, like you can come to us and we're going to host some workshops. We're going to go through like we have gone through, but in more details in this kind of workshop. And we're going to try to make them understand more. Um, so another thing I just want to clarify, you have seen me speaking a little bit more and I, along with Hannah. Um, I am a staff. I had nothing to do with any of these um, changes. I Some of the changes are uh, probably does not reflect, do not reflect my personal opinion and personal view. Um, I have a different opinions on many different things and the governance committee has um, noticed that I have a different opinions, but I had nothing to do with any of the changes was based upon the membership consultation and then professional consultation as well as the governing documents and research and then a final recommendation were made by the governance committee itself yeah and just to be clear uh, the board is our the ultimate decision making body of ursu as we all know um, maybe we should share these presentations with them as well uh, ju just in advance our next board meeting is on the 18th so um, this is a lot to take in the sooner we get it to them the better uh, so that they can make an informed decision I have a question privately from Joyce. Um, I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question correctly, but if you could just privately message me with more explanation of the question. And while well, that gets a little bit sorted, anything else? Sorry, Hannah, I just want, also wanted to mention that some of the stuff still needs to be discussed, I think. Um, for example, um, having um, reducing number of position of the board. So uh, this is not the end of the world. Uh, we will still um, di discuss those things with the members and then uh, we will kind of find a balance uh, to go forward. So this project is all about the balance um, to make sure that um, organization is running smoothly and have a very good, strong um, connection. But uh, there will be some reasonings behind for any any of the things but if you have it it's better to let know from you beforehand so we can still have some rooms to talk and then do some thing but um if we end up not talking or um contributing then we um, um ask something question or do something in the sgm or something then we will have no room to make some changes rather or accept or reject and if we in case accept it, that's fine. If we reject it any time, it's going to put an organization to a, some sort of issues uh, going forward legally. But um, I really, really encourage everyone to talk. Um, everything is considered. Um, as far as the, from a start perspective, I can say that every single suggestion were considered. Whether they were wild, they were very small, <laughs> but were considered. OK. Um, well, I think we can start wrapping up shortly, but just to reiterate, um, there's a question. Um, so um, if I'm not wrong, um, every Ursu fee paying member is a member of your pride as well, um, not a direct board member. Um, so I think all of us are part of your pride. And I think part of our consultations is um, was giving openings to our student centers to speak. But if you would like to um, speak on behalf of your pride, we're open to feedback or um, we could set something up later on. Um, we've been working a lot with Brendan as well. Why don't we send uh, the, these to the service centers? That might be a good way to consult with them before we finish up everything. So that's a great idea, Joyce. Maybe we'll just do that. And just for the record, I'm totally a member of your pride, great organization. 
Absolutely. Okay. So please, please reach out because this document is actually just something for our members. Like this whole governance thing is to make it suit us better. And so we can actually make it anything we want. Um, so make sure you reach out if there are any wants or needs for this process. Okay, Joyce, as board of directors. Okay. We will set something up with your pride. Was there any other stakeholder groups? Um, so we have our student centers and we've been doing the consultations with different student groups and clubs. Yes, all of the student centers, we can do that. Bronwyn, could you please take a note of uh, the student centers um, that we have also talked? And for the note, um, unofficially, we have talked to a lot of student centers, but officially we can make that happen. We have already talked to First Nation where, uh, and then um, they have no objection. If they have, we'll talk to them later. Um, and then uh, we haven't officially talked to your pride um, and then Carolyn, but that's our next to do list. We have put this information. To, so we don't want to give them an open blank page of talking. We're just going to give them information and get their suggestion later. So we're going to do that in next probably four or five days. But thanks for all of your suggestion. It's very awesome. Okay, let's end it there. Um, but make sure to reach out everyone. And thank you so much for your time. Have a great evening. Another small note, we're going to create a discussion forum under this document in the next five, uh, five days uh, in our Ursu, um, 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 Ursu groups, uh, it's called Universe. Uh, we're gonna send the link to the directly to the website and then you will have able to write uh, if anything you would like around these, any of the things. So uh, it would be much more accessible if you wanna do that. If you don't wanna, you know, uh, if you don't have enough time to come to this for consultation or something, you can write anytime at your convenience. And Dave, it might be good to send out a survey. We just got access to our survey uh, system again. So we can send out a survey if you have a list of questions you wanna ask students. It might be easier for them to just click on an email and go through the survey. So if that's an idea you like, we can do that. Yeah, um, definitely survey was a consideration at the very first, but because of the logistical issue that we weren't able to do the survey and because the issue is so big. So in the survey, it has to be very defined what we mean by each of the question. Um, so it's not something we can guess yes or no, rather than explaining why this is happening, why this is, shouldn't be happening or something. Um, so um, I think yeah, this is a good option. We can probably work toward, and I probably might need some of the help from the staff, other staff and executives around the survey, um, just because uh, we're in a very, I don't wanna say how many hours I work, but <laughs> we're, we're in a very tight schedule. <laughs> And don't end the call. Sorry, I have a direct message and I just need to take a picture of it. I was just going to let you know. Oh. <laughs> yes, yeah. I appreciate that. No problem. Thank you. All right. Don't forget to turn off the recording. Whose computer is this getting saved on?